Welcome to this week's View on Africa, uh, covering Somalia's delayed elections. My name is Omar Mahmoud, and I'm a researcher here at the Institute uh, for Security Studies in the Pretoria office. And so today we are looking at uh, Somalia's elections, and um, I'll start out and provide a little bit of the background to the current process and, and overlay um, what uh, the, the model really is here uh, for these 2016 elections, then discuss some of the ongoing issues that have, that have delayed uh, the elections and hindered some aspects of it, and then briefly touch upon um, some tasks for uh, any incoming future administration, and then uh, move into the question and answer section. So to start, um, as part of its continuing transition, Somalia is scheduled to hold elections this year for a new government. And this builds on a process um, that's been going on. In, in 2012, we saw the inauguration of the Somali federal government, which brought to close 12 years of transitional government. Um, that, 200, uh, that 2012 process, though, was, was a bit problematic and considered to be rife with corruption. In that model, essentially, clan elders decided the entire uh, parliamentary um, delegation. And so it was a very closed and elite-driven process. The hope was that in 2016, the conditions would be in place for a one-person, one-vote model and to make that feasible. And while that was the initial plan, as of about last July, uh, Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud ruled that out. And this was done for, for a few different reasons. Um, security concerns is one of the big ones. Al-Shabaab is still a big threat uh, throughout much of the country. Uh, logistical considerations, a, a proper census has not been done, uh, voter registration rules, um, a lot of technical concerns for a country that really hasn't organized this sort of process in some time. Uh, and then some also point to a lack of political will on the part of some politicians. So uh, where did that leave us? Uh, so with universal suffrage not possible, what, where did that leave us for 2016? And essentially what happened is there was a committee known as the National Leadership Forum, and they kind of decided the, the, the current process. Uh, now the National Leadership Forum uh, the NLF consists of the president, the prime minister, the parliamentary speaker, and presidents of uh, the Somalia's federal member states. So there, there's a question of impartiality here because some of those members themselves are going to be running for president. So um, it's got kind of a question of whether they should be deciding and dictating the rules of the game. At any rate, they have set out uh, the parameters thus far, and despite some opposition here and there, it's been uh, accepted as, as the way forward. And there, there's some important changes from what happened in, in 2012, as we'll get to. So first of all, uh, in Parliament, there's going to be two houses this time around. So there's an upper house, which is going to be selected and represents the federal member states. So this is new. The, the upper house was written into the provi uh, provisional constitution in, in 2012, but since most of the federal member states, aside from uh, Poland and Somaliland, hadn't yet been formed, this didn't really get off the ground. In the uh, ensuing four years, we now have uh, federal member states formed in, in the Juba region, uh, in the southwest, and Galmadug as well, and there's an ongoing process for the Haran Middle Shabele areas. So the upper house uh, consists of a total of 54 seats and the idea is to have equal representation for um, each uh, federal member state uh, in addition to an extra three seats for Puntland and Somaliland due to their uh, political maturity. Now, uh, the, the, there was a bit of debate over the uh, number of seats and the division of the seats um, and at some point uh, and an extra two were given to the Bonadir region, which is not a federal member state, but really more of a federal capital or a national kind of capital area. Um, and so they were given two seats, but it seems like the, those have been rescinded. So there's some questions about, about their status as well. Um, some, some discussions as to uh, uh, Puntland and Somaliland getting uh, extra seats. And of course, Somaliland 
themselves are not participating in in the process, um, but will be represented by uh, uh, some members who are originally from uh, Somaliland. Um, and, and so some questions about how that's going to take place as well. Nonetheless, at the end of the day, an agreement to stick to these 54 seats and uh, the federal member state presidents themselves will nominate two candidates for each seat and their state parliaments will vote for them um, and that'll be the, the selection process. So with the, with the new timeline, the deadline actually for uh, federal member state presidents to nominate those, those uh, delegates is today. So we'll see how that uh, goes and, and could be an indication of um, whether uh, uh, we'll be sticking to timelines this time around. The other part of parliament is the lower house or also uh, known as the House of People. Now, this was the only part of parliament in the 2012 election. Um, and as mentioned in that process, uh, a list of 135 clan elders who are divided on this 4.5 clan formula. And essentially that means the four biggest clans, the Hawaii, Rahawain, Deer, and Darod, get equal representation while minority clans get half as much. So in 2012, those clan elders selected all 275 uh, uh, lower house seats. So with universal suffrage not being possible in 2016, there's still a need to make this process more inclusive. And what's happening is there, there's an extra step thrown involved. So now those 135 clan elders will instead be selecting electoral colleges for each, each uh, lower house seat. And these electoral colleges will consist of 51 different delegates. And there's some stipulations in there that out of this 51, 16 of the delegates should be women, 10 should be youth. Um, so designed to get a bit more of a diverse profile in there. Uh, but those, those 51 delegates per seat uh, will then select the parliamentarians. So that means you have uh, 275 seats times 51 uh, uh, people per each seat, and that's 14,025 total uh, people involved in the selection process for the lower house this time around. So the idea is it's a slightly more inclusive process overall, and um, hopefully in this way there's less opportunity for corruption and manipulation of that process. So with the uh, recently announced delays, this should be taking place the 23rd of October to the 10th of November, so getting underway in a few weeks. Now, once, once Parliament's been selected, a few other steps will happen. Uh, the big one is on 30th of November, both houses will vote for the next president. And this will be done by secret ballot this time, which, which is another change. And the president must win a two-thirds majority in both houses. Uh, and then just to complete the cycle, the president appoints a prime minister and the prime minister in turn presents his council of ministers, which represents the executive power. So that's uh, the process in a nutshell with a federal indirect electoral implementation team managing uh, the vote and separate state level teams within the federal member states. Uh, so as mentioned, there are some significant changes from 2012, and the primary driver for this is the need to expand the inclusiveness of, of this political project, um, especially in the disappointing admission that a one-person, one-vote system wouldn't be possible. Uh, and, and tied into that is, is the need also to limit the perspective that this is purely an elite driven process. So by opening it up a bit more, you can uh, moderate that perception a little bit. Now, while, while it is more inclusive, we're talking again, 14,025 delegates for the lower house. In, in a country uh, with an estimated population of 12 million, that's still uh, just a drop in the bucket. So it doesn't seem like a lot, but again, if you, if you look back to 2012, it is a step in the right direction. So a small step perhaps, but, but a step in the right direction. The, the inclusion of the upper house though is uh, pretty important I think, and, and this uh, again represents the federal member states. So in the previous parliament, when you didn't have the upper house, essentially you just had the lower house 
uh, passing legislation or undertaking action. And the federal member states themselves could kind of say, well, I wasn't really involved in that process. It doesn't affect me. I had no representation. Now the, the federal member state regional presidents themselves will have essentially handpicked supporters that uh, they've sent out to parliament and, and will be representing them. So they can no longer say, you know, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't involve me. So this should add legitimacy to legislation passed by uh, the parliament and deepen this, this uh, relationship between uh, the Somali government and its, its federal uh, entities. And again, this was again laid out in the constitution in 2012 as well. So the fact that it's being implemented now is another step in the right direction. One other important change is that in 2012, voting only took place in Mogadishu. Um, this time it's gonna occur in the federal member states themselves. So for the Southwest, this will be in Baidoa. In uh, Galmadug area, this will be in Adado. For Puntland, in Garraway. For the Jubiland interim Jubiland administration, this will take place in Kismayo. Mogadishu will still uh, likely be the place for Bonadir and the Somaliland representation. And there's a bit of an ongoing dispute as to where the vote for the Hiran Middle Shabele ongoing state uh, will take place. Um, uh, at one point it was said Mogadishu, but some other people have, have challenged that, uh, and that's an issue we can uh, discuss a little bit more in depth. But the main point is that this is another step in, in moving the vote out of Mogadishu. It's another step in trying to, to expand the inclusiveness of this project. Now, the, the role of clan is still very important, and um, in the lower house, uh, despite some discussions, uh, Somalia wasn't able to get away from this 4.5 clan formula. Now, this, this formula has been present in Somali politics for uh, a couple of decades, and it's worked in the past, though minority clans uh, do suffer a bit. But that, that's the point. It's an agreed upon compromise solution, and it has worked in the past. So it, it represents the path of least resistance. Uh, any new sort of system or um, uh, process would invariably create uh, some winners and losers and change the balance of the current clans. So by not kind of uh, going down that route and avoiding that chance, there, there's, I think, an implicit recognition that perhaps the Somali political process isn't really ready yet for that sort of um, open uh, competition. Uh, one way they are uh, attempting to address this, though, is that uh, having all parliamentarians join a political party by 2018, by the end of 2018. And these political parties, in theory, should have branches across the country uh, to avoid diminishing, uh, to, to avoid appealing to a specific clan base. So th this is one role. Uh, one potential area to diminish the role of clan uh, on the political process. Again, that hasn't been put in place yet, so we'll see how that plays out in practice. But uh, essentially all these, these um, measures are designed to show progress in this continuing uh, buildup of, of the electoral system uh, on the way, hopefully, to universal suffrage in 2020. Uh, so I think it begs to ask the question, is the process on the right track? And there's an interesting study from the Heritage Institute for Policy Studies, a think tank based in Mogadishu, uh, that last year found out of um, uh, their interviewees that 79% agreed that in the current context, a one person, one vote electoral model simply wasn't feasible. So th there is an agreement amongst the Somali population uh, and that, that gives some breathing room. At the same time, that study also found that rates of approval for the current government were, were extremely low and 60% uh, actually opposed any extension of the current government's uh, mandate, which has uh, essentially happened with the, the delayed elections. So there is a recognition that uh, it, it's a tough environment and perhaps uh, one person, one vote wasn't ready in 2016, but it also uh, raises the point of how long the system can can go on before it loses uh, legitimacy within the eyes of the Somali people and puts a lot of pressure on the the 2020 process to be significantly more inclusive. 
However, before we even get to, to 2020, there's still a lot of issues we should be talking about uh, to make sure this election gets off the ground. And, and the first does relate to these timetables. So voting has been delayed uh, twice, and uh, technically the presidential and parliamentary mandates have, ex have already expired. So some calling this already an unconstitutional process. And there's a lot of questions as to um, as to the reasons for these extensions and and uh, accus accusations of who's benefiting from them and uh, potential opportunity to um, increase manipulation uh, within the process. Um, and, and given that they've already been delayed twice, there's still a lot of, of, of issues to resolve with. Some have even speculated that perhaps early 2017 might be a more realistic uh, outcome. Uh, for his part, President Mahmoud has, has promised no further dis, uh, delays um, in spite of some concern from the federal uh, interim electoral uh, uh, committee. Uh, another big issue re resolves around the uh, representation of females in, in the parliament. So there's a stipulation that 30% of seats should be reserved for women. Now the last election, the 2012 parliament had the same stipulation but this wasn't quite met with only 14% uh, of the seats actually going to women. And, and it's a tough issue um, at, at one level, parliament, even though it is uh, expanding to this electoral college system, the lower house is still relying on this clan list, uh, clan elder list at its core, which is all male. Uh, and um, just, just this week, uh, an association of clerics in Somalia kind of came out against this 30% quota saying it was a, a foreign-directed uh, initiative and, and, and could upset, really, Somali society in some way. So it just shows the, the, the uphill battle on this uh, particular provision. Now, President Mahmoud uh, has affirmed that women will wind up with, with 81 seats in the lower house. And one way this will be done is, is clans with three seats will have uh, one one um, reserve for a woman, while clans with less than three seats but are, are will be aggregated with, with related clans, and then one of those seats will also be reserved for women. So it again raises an issue of which one of those clans will wind up uh, uh, appointing um, a woman in one of their seats. So and it's not really clear if there's a mechanism to address this either if the quota is not met. Um, the federal indirect electoral implementation team has kind of threatened to block nominations until this is addressed, uh, but we'll see if that plays out in practice. There's a number of, of disputes and potential spoilers uh, that can arise in any sort of competitive process, but especially in this case, given some clan and territorial um, sort of uh, continued uh, issues. So looking at just a few of them, uh, in the interim Galmanduk administration, there's uh, continuing issues with Puntland over territorial control of the, of the Muduk region. Um, and uh, we just saw some violence there uh, last week in, in a very strange incident where U.S. forces were accused of, of having killed some Galmaduk um, soldiers on the behalf of, of of a Puntland while they thought they were fighting uh, Al Shabaab members. So there's a very odd incident, and and an investigation is still going on, but just shows the potential for violence to flare up along that sort of area. Also within the interim Galmaduk administration, you have Ahl Sunnah Al Jama, the ASWA, sitting in the capital of Dusa Mareb and and controlling it, and they have been frozen out by this process as well, and and saying they they're not partaking and going about it on on their own way. So another uh, a major issue and, and potential spoiler that can arise. We've been talking uh, a little bit about the, the state formation process for Haran Middle Shabeli. So it's the only federal member state that has yet to be formed. And it's coming up to uh, a quick timeline here with elections scheduled just for a few weeks. Um, and, and there's been, uh, again, disputes, especially from some Haran clan elders which have been upset about perceived uh, government manipulation in the state formation process. So they've threatened to, to go about their own way and just form their own administration as well, while there's still an ongoing conference to try to push these two states together. Um, so kind of two competing sort of, sort of areas and, and rushing through elections in the face of this sort of opposition 
and risk having having um, some frozen out of, of this process is is you know a recipe for potential future uh, issues. And we've also seen in the past Al Shabaab successfully recruit from marginalized clans and take advantage in that way. So it opens up a potential opportunity for them. Now, Al Shabaab themselves, we barely uh, even talked about. They're they're a significant actor and still very active in the countryside and control some territory. And I think their their threat has been uh, uh, prominently on display in the, in the past year in the form that we see continued attacks on hotels and restaurants in, in Mogadishu areas that are uh, supposedly a bit more secure. There's been a worrying trend of Al-Shabaab being able to overrun some Amazon bases over the past uh, year and a half. Um, and, and they're still controlling um, some areas and taking uh, control over a few towns here and there uh, after Amazon or, or other forces pull out. Now with regards to the election specifically, spokesman Al-Shabaab spokesman Ali Diri has, has uh, threatened just about two weeks ago to disrupt these elections, to attack uh, polling stations and warned uh, the clan elders not to participate. Um, so that clan elder list, it is a public list, all, all 135 of them uh, are known. And um, the flip side of expanding the vote to areas outside Mogadishu uh, to, to um, the federal member states is that it does offer an opportunity, a uh, greater opportunity for al-Shabaab to um, disrupt the process through violence. Um, and if really, if you want to look at their impact, in some ways, Al-Shabaab already has disrupted the process, given the fact that the one person, one vote model was ruled out in a large part due to uh, security concerns. But there's a risk of, of very specific uh, violence uh, related around the vote upcoming. And so just quickly, I'll touch on some of the, some of the tasks any future government's going to have to deal with. Um, th there's a lot of them and, and a lot of big issues. Uh, one is the constitution. It needs to be approved. Uh, this was supposed to happen before this vote, but it's kind of been pushed on the back burner to after the elections. Uh, and it should also be subject uh, technically to some sort of popular process. We'll have to see uh, how that plays out uh, given the, the organizational, organizational difficulties that we've seen uh, thus far in organizing. Uh, that sort of um, uh, vote. Uh, continued clan and elder, uh, clan and territorial disputes. Uh, we touched on a few of them. There's kind of a feeling that basically prior to the election, the government can only tackle so much. So I think some of those, as long as they're not openly violent, have been put on the back burner. But uh, expectation that any future government will have to uh, deal with those. Perhaps one of the biggest ones uh, is Amazon's making noise about withdrawing. They're planning on transferring tasks uh, to Somali security actors by 2018 ahead of a full withdrawal by 2020. So this is going to be a monumental task and uh, one that uh, is probably perhaps the biggest um, aspect for any incoming administration to deal with. Uh, and then finally, the 2020 elections, uh, which are currently scheduled for one person, one vote. A lot of work needs to be done ahead of that, such as you know, census, voter registration, other organizational aspects, and just working backwards, you know, if that vote's supposed to happen in 2020, by 2019, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, certain things will have to be done by 2018 and just, just keep working backwards, meaning uh, they'll probably have to get moving on that pretty soon. So it's a ton to do, and it just highlights the need to get this, this process right. So even if it's still, uh, somewhat in 2016 of an elite driven process. The hope is that there's some capable elites that can steer the country in the right direction rather than the election merely being uh, an income generating activity for those involved.